Hi, I'm Dr. Alan Rappaport. I'm a clinical professor of neurology at UCLA. And today I'm working for Neurology Reviews. And we're here at the American Academy of Neurology in Philadelphia. And I'm here with Professor Tepper, who will introduce himself and tell you what his credentials are. And then I'm going to ask him a couple of questions. Stu? I'm Stuart Tepper. I'm a professor of neurology at the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth in Hanover, New Hampshire, and I am director of the Dartmouth Headache Center at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center in Lebanon, New Hampshire. Alan. So you've been to a lot of meetings the last couple of days, and you've seen a lot of posters, and you're a guy that keeps all this stuff in your head and on your cheat sheets. And um, I want to ask you a couple of kind of leading questions that can go very far. But I'm particularly interested in knowing what's come out here at this meeting about the monoclonal antibodies and about the newer small molecule receptor antagonists. And the monoclonal antibodies are out and are available, at least three of the four of them are, and the others are not yet out. So um, I guess the first thing to start with would be, is there anything about safety that you can tell us about the small molecule receptor antagonist? One of the things that we've always been worried about is liver toxicity uh, going way back 15 years ago. So tell us if any new news has come out about liver toxicity for the small molecules. Well, the small molecules, as you said, the G pants are metabolized through the liver, and at least two of the first G pants were associated with liver toxicity. The FDA then has mandated some pretty careful looking for liver toxicity with the newer ones, which are Ubrojapant, Remegapant, and Atojapant. And at this meeting, at the AAN meeting in May of 2019, a uh, presentation was given in which healthy volunteers, quite a large number of healthy participants in a phase one trial, were given Ubrojapant, 100 milligrams, two days on, one day off for eight weeks while they had repeated liver function tests and an independent adjudication committee that was blinded to whether the patients received placebo or Ubrojapant then evaluated liver function test abnormalities. And there were two ALT elevations that really received some scrutiny. In two one, separate patients. Two separate patients with Ubrojapan in the active group. In one, the ALT rose spontaneously but didn't quite reach three times the upper limit of normal. It remitted the, the level returned to normal. They While kept, the patient was on the medication. Yeah, I was just going to say, the patient just kept was kept on the medicine and uh, the patient was asymptomatic and it was a rather mysterious blip and felt to be possibly related to Ubrojapan, but certainly not of any clinical um, uh, consequence. The second study, uh, the patient had an elevation of ALT to a little bit over three times the upper limit of normal, and the Ubrojapan was discontinued for four days. The level came right back down, the Ubrojapan was restarted. The level never went back up again. Again, the patient was asymptomatic. Again, it seemed like a random blip. And this time, the adjudication committee thought that the elevation was probably related to the Ubrojapan. But since neither of these abnormalities persisted or had any clinical manifestation, the overall um, take home from this study was that it looked like Ubrojapan was pretty doggone safe from a liver standpoint. And nothing happened to the placebo patients? Uh, actually, the placebo patients did have a few elevations, okay. and some of them were felt to be possibly related to study drug without them knowing it was placebo. So pretty much a wash. It was a wash. Okay. And so that's a reassuring wash. Yeah, very much so. Anything else about the G-Pants that we should talk about before we get to the monoclonal antibodies? Well, it's important to be aware that Ubrojapant was submitted to the FDA in February of this year uh, for the acute treatment of migraine. That would be the indication. And Remegapant is expected to be submitted to the FDA in the first half of 2019. So we would expect these drugs to be out probably by this, the AAN meeting of next year, both of them for the acute treatment of migraine. 
Atojapant and Remedjapant are also currently being tested on a daily dosing regimen for the preventive treatment of migraine. Okay. So let's turn now to the monoclonals. I know there was a lot of information released. I'm most interested in hearing what you have to say about efficacy, comparing the three, which I know is difficult to do, uh, long-term safety, which we have a lot of data on now, and I'm very interested in medication overuse and the diagnosis of chronic migraine with medication overuse and what happens to the patients that are on a monoclonal. It's useful, I think, to think of this in a matrix. So for each of these monoclonal antibodies, you have a regulatory trial, randomized control trial for episodic migraine, at least one, for chronic migraine, at least one, and then for each of them, open label extension, safety and tolerability trials that also evaluate efficacy across time in patients that remain on the drug. And at this meeting, and a great deal of information was presented from the open label extension trials. Um, and the open label extension trials give you the opportunity to compare to where the patients were at the end of the randomized control trial as well. Um, let's just talk about efficacy first. It appears that the um, monoclonal antibodies actually accumulate greater efficacy across time. Now, there's always this bias that occurs with open label extensions because people that hate the drug drop off the drug. So you are evaluating patients in an open label extension that like the drug and that are probably responders and that tolerate the drug across time. But the dropout rate for the open label extension trials, for example, for arenumab, were relatively low. About 25% dropped across a year, 20% of which uh, were uh, withdrawal of consent for whatever reason, usually moving away, those kinds of things. I don't want to keep the diary anymore. Um, Four percent were, uh, were adverse events and six percent were lack of efficacy. And those were very similar to the numbers for Fremenizumab that were presented. So these are very low rates of discontinuation for adverse events or lack of efficacy and can be contrasted to the topiramate randomized control trial where 44% of patients were off the drug by 12 weeks. So this is a real change in paradigm in terms of uh, tolerability and efficacy. Um, uh, open label extensions were shown for galconezumab, fremenizumab, arenumab, chronic migraine, episodic migraine. You say over time more patients seem to improve. Uh, is there a crest where they kind of level off? Is it three months? Is it six months? Is it one year? Or don't we know that? Yet? I don't think we know. Okay. I mean, I think it's worth taking a look at what happens at the end of a randomized control trial and then comparing to the patients who stayed in on the drug across a year. For example, for the arenumab trial, uh, at the end of 12 weeks in the randomized control trial, 40% of patients, regardless of dose, had at least a 50% reduction in their mean monthly migraine days. At the end of a year, the patients who were on 140 milligrams, 40% of patients had at least a 75% reduction in their mean monthly migraine days, and they dropped uh, with both doses at the end of 12 weeks, they dropped by about six days from a baseline of 18 days. At the end of a year, they dropped 10 days from a baseline of 18 days with the 140 milligram dose. That's four months of no migraine per year that these patients got. That's a tremendous clinical difference. Anything pop out about a particular type of adverse event in any of the trials that would make us be concerned that we shouldn't keep our patients on for a long period? Of time. Well, it's always important to maintain vigilance with a new class of medicines, but it's also important to separate accumulated vetted adverse events from social media hype. And what we saw at this meeting was a set of reports very extensive, looking at all randomized control trials, all open label extension trials, 
to as long as five years with absolutely no signal for vascular abnormalities, for neuromuscular abnormalities, for bone abnormalities, for GI abnormalities. There's no signal. That's very reassuring. It is very reassuring. I don't think that we should let our vigilance down, but I, I still feel like with each successive meeting and with each successive careful look at the adverse events, we can feel a little more reassured. There are over 250,000 patients on these drugs now worldwide. Wow. It's less than a year. Last thing I want to cover, uh, dear to my own heart, is medication overuse. You and I have struggled, as many of our comrades have around the world, with patients who have chronic migraine, who overuse acute care medication, not because they're bad people, but because they're trying to feel better, and they often make themselves worse, and they don't respond well to some of our previous preventives. What about with the monoclonals? Well, it's actually an extremely interesting turn of events for those of us that have been taking care of chronic migraine and medication overuse for a very long time. Uh, Richard Lipton presented two different open label extension trials as well as randomized control trials evaluating for fremonezumab and arenimab what percentage of patients converted from chronic migraine to episodic migraine by the end of the randomized control trials and then across a year. And the answer is the majority convert from, from chronic migraine to episodic migraine, which is really fantastic. Two thirds of patients converted. Uh, in the arenimab trials, they evaluated persistence that is, once a patient had converted from chronic migraine to episodic migraine, did they stay in episodic migraine? Over 90%, there was over 90% persistence with over two thirds of patients converting. So that's incredibly good news. That's really a change in what we would expect the natural history to be. Even accounting, and Richard did, for the, for the spontaneous remission of some patients from chronic to episodic. It's also been very clear for all four of these monoclonal antibodies that they dramatically reduce all acute medication use. They re excluding opioids and barbiturates, which were not studied. They reduce triptan use. They reduce combination analgesic use. They reduce simple analgesic use, including non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and acetaminophen. And they convert patients from acute medication overuse medication overuse, headache, to non-acute medication overuse simply by being in the active group and taking the biologic for periods of three, six, 12 months. So there is a dramatic change, I think, in, in my, at least in my approach for medication overuse. And I discuss with patients, I really want you to have a reduction in your combination analgesic use and in your triptan use. And we're going to start this monoclonal antibody and we're going to see where you are in three or four months. And let's make an effort to try to not treat low level headaches and, and see where you are. And I see the same thing. I see the majority of my patients remitting. What do you see? Exactly the same thing. And it makes our job quite a bit easier and it makes me wonder more about medication overuse and what is it and what it does and so on. But in this situation, exactly as you say, you tell the patient not to take as much, but they don't have to worry about it because they're having fewer headaches, so they don't have to take as much unless they have a behavioral issue with it, and you just have to say to them, don't take it for a mild headache. So It's a real shift in paradigm. It is. It's a real watershed moment in migraine. It's incredibly exciting. Glad we got to see it. It really, it is. It's really a pleasure to see it. All right. Well, thanks very much okay, for your information my pleasure. today. Thanks so much.